Hey listeners, welcome into the first episode in our new series, Gloom Cravens, where we uh, explore a game that has been looming over our shelf of shame for a while now. We do just want to give a heads up before the episode starts that we are going to reveal some details or explanations of what is described in the scenario book. So if you are at all concerned for the story of this long-term campaign game, Go ahead and play the first introductory scenario in the campaign book before listening to the episode. That way, nothing that we share will ruin any of your experience. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts on Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. Welcome to Hours Played, a podcast for couples looking for the perfect cooperative game. I'm Bailey. And I'm Rob. And the time has come to tackle Gloomhaven. Sure, uh, we're starting with the introductory box, Jaws of the Lion, but that still counts. We're still doing it, no matter how much it scares us. We're very brave. For those of you who might have missed our podcast update episode, Patch Notes 1.0, This mini-series that we're calling Gloom Cravens allows us to tackle a long-term, in-depth co-op campaign game that just can't be fully understood in our normal two-week turnaround that we usually give ourselves to research a game and be ready to uh, share it with you all. So we're excited for this project, and um, this first episode will be a great start. Absolutely. There's plenty of games that we just can't put together within that window. But don't worry, we are still going to be putting out our regular co-op content, but we will also be interspersing some more specialty episodes, just like this one. To start off, we do want to give a disclaimer. We're not here to teach you how to play. Nope. There's probably better places and formats than audio only to learn how to play a big, complicated board game. Uh, If I knew of any of them, I would plug them here, but I don't. But that's not our goal. We're, we're not going to read the rule book to you. We're not going to explain a lot of the fundamental mechanics. Um, this series is going to be more focused on our own experiences with the game and tackling some ideas related to these bigger games that are going to take a long time to play when we, as we've admitted to in some previous episodes, are stressed and busy and don't have a lot of time to dedicate to the games that we do sit down to play. Uh, but with that out of the way, we thought it would be helpful to share what we think we know about the game uh, before we even crack a rule book. At this point, we've quote-unquote unboxed it to organize the components and the insert uh, and looked at the map because it was cool to look at and I like maps, Uh, but we haven't read the rules so we don't know how to play. We have not seen it played by anyone. Uh, We have not read any reviews or anything like that, so we are going in about as blind as we can without, or with the exception of peeking in the box at one point. (laughs) Bailey, how did you first hear about Gloomhaven? Yeah, I think this is going to be good to set our baseline experience for the game. Social media is how I found out about Gloomhaven. When I started the Instagram account for Hours Played and started following a bunch of other gaming-related accounts, I saw so many photos of Gloomhaven. The elaborate table setups, just the box itself, players at the table. And I was really interested in learning something about it, but you just don't get as much out of an individual post. I can definitely understand why this game was all over Instagram. Not being an Instagram person myself, I don't, I'm not aware of what people are posting on there, but this game was, I, I think, number one on the Board Game Geek Top 100 for a long time. That's how I first learned about it. And I looked at it and of course I was like, oh, this looks really great. And then I looked at the price and was like, oh my goodness. (laughs) Um, Well, I'm never going to be able to afford Gloomhaven. So, oh well. Um, Which makes Jaws of the Lion a a much better entry point for us because the uh, starting price point, the investment for something that might be just too much of a time commitment or too complex is much more approachable. Given our limited knowledge base of all things Gloomhaven, What are you expecting from this? What do you think the game is going to be like? Yeah, from the little bits that I've taken in, and now that I know that we're doing this series, I was was intentional about not trying to look up more information. I am picturing, you know, something dark, high fantasy, very complicated, (laughs) given 
just what you can imagine the large big box game that has taken over takes people months to complete and character and character going through it but i'm also hoping that jaws of the lion is going to be an accessible introduction to the series now rob thinking about um you know you looking at this up on board game geek years ago um why are you so excited to play this game it will be my first experience with a campaign board game, something that is supposed to be kept up with over multiple play sessions. I've had a lot of games like this on my wish list, but not a lot of standing board game nights with larger groups that could take on campaign games like this. And obviously COVID did not help not being able to have people over to play more complicated board games. I know we've looked at the Lord of the Rings campaign game that has the phone app that you use to support your progress through the story. And we've looked at some other campaign games as well, but we, we've never really pulled the trigger because of the time commitment and the need to have a larger group to play with. So um, being able to sit down just the two of us and play through a campaign game like this is very exciting. And I'm hoping that it gives something akin to a tabletop role-playing game experience. Um, since we've started getting our friends into Dungeons and Dragons and tabletop role playing. I have been the DM, um, and so I have not been able to play uh, my own character or anything like that. And while DMing is fun, I think part of the appeal of something like Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion, is that I get to be a character alongside you. You and I are playing from the same side of the story, whereas when we're sitting down to play tabletop role playing games, I know a, a lot more of what's going on behind the scenes and how everything is coming together. Um, and like I said, that's fun, but the reason that you and I like cooperative games is because we like playing together. And thinking about when we first started playing tabletop games together, it literally was you and me, and you were the DM, and I think you also made a character for yourself. And not only is that a lot of pressure for you to come up with the world, but I wasn't able to interact with you in the same way I would if you were just another player character. And so while we're limited with who we can have over or even allowing for something different than having a campaign experience only being D&D &D and requiring someone to be the world builder, I'm looking forward to being able to, to play with you in that sense. But up until this point, we bought this back around Christmas. And it hasn't budged on our shelf since then. And I think we were just a little bit intimidated. And there's plenty of games that are out there, board games, video games, and otherwise, that sometimes look really appealing, but you just can't psych yourself up enough to either pull the trigger to purchase or sit down and play. Anything come to mind in terms of games that are intimidating or, or why we get that way about things we enjoy? This series and it, it, its title was all kind of surrounding this question is why are these bigger long-term projects of games, why do they almost feel intimidating? Why do you get so excited to buy them and add them to your collection, but then they sit on the shelf or you take them out a couple times and then they fall by the wayside and kind of the understanding of that process. And I think a lot of it does come down to time commitment. I know I feel this with video games a lot more than I used to because I don't have as much time to play games anymore. Something that I'm even really excited for and have been enjoying like Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice. You know, I'm a huge From Software fan and all of their games. I love all the Dark Souls games. I've been really enjoying Sekiro so far but it's harder to sit down and pick up and play because I know it's a longer term project. I know it's going to take me a lot of hours of trial and error to even get past, you know, the next boss that I have coming up. Compare that to something like a roguelike game where you know you can sit down for a run that lasts maybe 60 minutes or so and then put the controller down without feeling like you're not finished with this big project, um, which is a really weird distinction because then you can go back and play multiple hours of the same roguelike and still have it be this big long project, but I don't know, it's something about story games or games that you know that if you don't finish it, you're missing out on something. It's, it's a very weird concept, but uh, I think time commitment definitely stands out as a big intimidation factor for something like Gloomhaven that is quickly becoming kind of a cliche of like a time sink of a game. 
I know you mentioned it about complexity, and I honestly, not knowing the rules, I don't know how complex it is. I don't really know any of the systems. It's possible that the systems themselves and the rules aren't that difficult. You know, it would behoove them, especially in the introductory version, Jaws of the Lion, to make it easy. I'm going off assumption. My assumption is that a game with many different components and also would take a long time, would have a lot that you need to do and accomplish, and therefore requires more rules, requires more steps. That's where my complexity comes in. But again, it's all supposition at this point since we haven't actually played. Sure. I'm trying to think about how the balance can break down between complexity in terms of what's in the box and then complexity in terms of what the actual rules are. You know, one of our staples, Eldritch Horror, has a lot of things in the box, but the rules come down to roll some dice, see if you get any fives or sixes, check for other special circumstances, and then see if you succeed or fail, basically. Um, so even though the game is very vast, it doesn't have a lot of complex rules. So I don't know. Well, I mean, that's something that we won't know until we, you know, break it open, learn how to play, and we'll definitely address that um, afterwards. Finally, price point for the original Gloomhaven is something that made it way too intimidating of um, almost feeling like it was above my level of like board game clout, which I know is really silly, but when you see a game that's like $100, $120, it's like, this game is designed for someone else out there who loves board games more than me, plays board games with their main group every night, and it almost like boxes you out based on just seeing that sticker shock of $120 for a game. You have gaming imposter syndrome. That's what that is. It's exactly what you just described. Someone else deserves this more than me. Yeah, that's really silly. Um, it, it, and I know I feel silly saying it, but it. I'm sure I'm not the only one to feel this way, which is why Jaws of the Lion is a thing. The original Gloomhaven I don't think would ever have been in the board game section of Target for us to just stumble across while I'm there to spend a gift card that I got. Right. Um... And so I'm sure they recognize that a, a, a big game like this has its own intimidation factor, and to sell more, we need to get people comfortable with it. So my hope is that Jaws of the Lion gets us through that initial uh, intimidation factor of something like Gloomhaven. What about you? Why, why do you think we put this off for so long after being so excited about it and unboxing it right when we got back home from Target? Why did it sit on the shelf, the shelf of shame? For us, I think it comes down to time, but beyond just general, it's going to take a while to get into this. I think the way we approach games has changed since we started the show. Um, it's not that they're not fun, but we go into it with a lens of what can we learn in order to put together a good episode in our timeline. And until we started to have the conversation of how could we shake up the timeline to then be able to offer different, more complex gaming content alongside things that can be accomplished in two weeks, I think we had limited ourselves and were not trying to get into it because how on earth would we be able to actually cover this within two weeks? And then we shook ourselves out of it and thought, we don't have to. Yeah, and we talk more about that in our Patch Notes update episode. So if you haven't listened to that, you can go back and listen. We explain a little bit in more detail uh, why we're making some of the changes to our release schedule of main episodes. I think this is a good starting point, but I think this is about as much as we can get into without just speculating wildly about what is in this box that we have sitting in front of us right now. So I think it's time that we go play so that we can talk about this game more. So we'll be right back. Bye-bye. All right. We are back fresh off of our first scenario in the tutorial of Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. Let's jump right into it. What are, what are your first impressions? What do you think? I had so much fun. And we're going to get into to why in a little bit, but starting at the top, what is always a, a bonus for us, if anybody has listened to us talk about other board games in the past, set up an organization of a new game, especially one that comes with as many components and cards and extra things as Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion does. When I had first taken the game out to 
to those uh, Instagram pictures a few months ago. Of course, I didn't know anything was, but I loved it. But it's definitely intimidating. But boy, do they make it nice and clear for you. 100%. The game is very well organized. It reminded me a lot of my first experience opening and setting up Aeon's End. Cards that go together are plastic wrapped together. Components that uh, all belong to a certain character are boxed up and divided by when you might need them. And the directions do a great job of clearly indicating, just put this away, you don't need it yet. And that really limits some of the confusion compared to other games where you're opening plastic wrap and punching things out and then you're left to wonder, what is all of this? Speaking of the instruction book, it does a great job directing you right to the YouTube tutorials from Watch It Played, probably one of the biggest board game tutorial channels out there. And there's a video for each of the five introductory scenarios. They walk you through setup, what should you be looking for in the scenario book, really streamlining the process of setting it up and getting to the gameplay. I don't think we've played another board game that takes advantage of those dual modes in really helping you get to learn how to play and actually directs you right to them. I know we've all become very familiar with asynchronous learning over the last year plus, but to have both sets of resources, hard copy and online, and both meant to work hand in hand, I found that really valuable. Some of us have become way too familiar with asynchronous learning, uh, and I'd really prefer that it doesn't find its way into my board games, but in this instance, <laughs> Given the goal of Jaws of the Lion being a tutorial introduction to the Gloomhaven, not really cinematic universe, cardboard universe, um, I, I find I found it to be a, a great resource. And I know the way we used it, we were kind of going more off the the scenario book and the instructions. And then if we weren't sure, we would we would go in and check with the video. So sometimes we'd have to jump around, but they're all timestamped with the YouTube timestamps, and it was very easy to navigate very logical flow to both the video and the instruction book. That covers a lot of the, the setup, the introduction. Um, honestly, the, the thing that probably scares away the most people is getting the game set up, ready to go, and learning the rules. Beyond that, though, you are kind of... At the start, you're, you're tasked with making an important choice of choosing your character. Since this is a campaign game, you have a handful of characters to choose from that you're actually going to play through this story and, and live in this world. Um, through. And I know this is where we found some of the co-op. Yes, since the game is designed to be um, played with a series of adventurers, this is where you're going to assemble your team. You have four character tokens to choose from, so we selected two. And being a podcast for couples focused around cooperative gaming, this is what we were really excited to get into is finding our characters and seeing how well they mesh together. So if you are joining ours played specifically for Gloomhaven, absolutely welcome. We are so excited to have you. Um, but as a reminder, if you're not familiar with our earlier work, we love to see how we can combine our very diverse personalities and gaming interests to serve a team unit in a game. Uh, and we certainly have a lot of opportunity to do that here in Gloomhaven. The game really encourages it to in the instruction booklet by giving a brief synopsis of a character's role or strength. So they don't leave your team building to chance or just making your own assumptions about what you expect the archetype of each character to be. I know the characters that we picked we thought kind of had complementary roles or would set us up to be the most successful in a two-person team. So I like that they made those resources available to you. We'll certainly see as we go forward. Do you want to talk a little bit about the characters that we selected? Sure. Why don't you start? Because I imagine your character would probably want to go first anyway. Yeah, I don't think she's one to hold her tongue or really wait for somebody else to take the first action. So I am playing the Demolitionist. She is described as being uh, very diminutive, very small, but an excellent tinkerer developing... Um, explosive devices that she and her compatriots are quick to use. She's also described as having thin, nimble fingers or spider fingers, if you are any of my relatives who tease me about my own hands. And she's very handy in crafting. And I sew and I like to make things, so I thought this one was a perfect combination. And you know me, if I've got the chance to blow something up as a character, I have a lot of fun. 
it very much reminded me of Rocket Raccoon from Guardians of the Galaxy, kind of technology, big explosions, and rough around the edges, and yes, small. <laughs> um, I thought it was a good fit. What about for you? I chose the Red Guard, who is... Their role is kind of defending teammates and also a little bit of crowd control for the enemies that you're going to be fighting. And I thought that would complement your role as the damage dealer, considering this game is going to largely be focused around combat. I, of course, named him after everyone's favorite villain from the Dungeons & Dragons cinematic universe, Profion. Uh, I was going to go with Venger due to the horned helmet that he wears, but all true Dungeons & Dragons cinematic universe fans will know that in the D&D cartoon, Venger is depicted with only one horn. Not in the center of his face like Uni the Unicorn. Venger's horn is on the side. <laughs> All D&D, uh, I guess, trivia, if you want to call it that, aside, um, the Red Guard was a lot of fun to play. I enjoy the, the role that he serves in the team already, both being a protector and slight healer of the party, um, but someone who's also able to deal some damage as well. So in the first scenario, um, you get started already as an established mercenary team, right? You have a relationship with your uh, with your party, and you have been hired because there have been some disappearances in the local area, and you unfortunately have not come up with much. But on your way home from your latest um, investigation, you are your path is blocked by vermling raiders. I would like to think that they're cuter than they are, for they are Rodentian enemies, but little low on the cute factor and very much in your way. You learn about this ambush from the scenario book. There is a little almost chapter by chapter, page by page plot that you're following, and they give you some exposition paragraphs to read, setting up the scenario, setting up your character's history. And as far as campaign start. Uh, it's, you know, a rung above, you meet in a tavern, um, but the goal is to get you into this tutorial scenario and get you moving, so I think it's good that uh, it basically boils down to you're walking along the road and ambush. The game and the video that accompanies it for guiding you through this first scenario do a good job of explaining that you are not meant to lose this first scenario. It is set up with some easy enemies, spaced out so you have time to tackle them a couple at a time and learn the mechanics. And again, going along with the thesis of this being a tutorial for this really complex game, I think it's handled really well. As far as our takeaways of what we liked from this first scenario, I am a huge fan of the two card turn system. Essentially, you have a hand of cards and you get to pick two that gives you two actions to choose from in either order. They also kind of tie into your initiative and deciding who goes when. It's a really interesting system of imperfect information or lack of communication because you can't coordinate with your partner before you pick and play your cards. Um, and seeing all the different pieces of the options on the card and the initiative fill out the turn is um, exciting to see how it all breaks down. It initially took me a round of combat to figure out the system because the cards can be used for both initiative and your actions. And then there's some element of, you know, combining the two together, but you are only reading the top and bottom of adjacent cards. After a round though, it was much more clear to me. And excellent point, honestly, about the imperfect communication it reminds me of some of the other games we've gotten to play for our main episodes, like The Crew, um, where we are working together, but we can't see each other's hands and it adds stakes to this. It keeps it from becoming a solvable tactics game where you have each other's perfect information and you can plan everything to a T. I think, um, at least with what we've seen so far, having some unknown information from turn to turn will help keep it will help keep the tension high during these long combats in the scenarios. As far as taking some time to learn these systems, they do an excellent job, again, introducing it to you because at the start of the ambush, there is one of these little vermling enemies at the front of the pack, and you and your party get to take it on by itself before the other ones are going to be able to reach you. You get a very clear example of these cards that I picked affect the game board in this way, 
oh, these cards really shouldn't have gone together. That was a stupid decision to make based on how they actually, how you actually get to choose actions from those cards. And it's a good low stakes way to get introduced to some more complex mechanics. The enemies also have pretty streamlined turns. If they're not next to you, they move closer to you by one square. If they are next to you, they attack, at least for these enemies, that's about as complex as they get. There are rules about how they move and attack. Um, in terms of seeking the closest player or seeking a player who they have attention towards. But for the most part, it is a lot faster than something like Pathfinder 2nd Edition that we've been playing, where if I have set up a huge group of enemies, the enemies' turns take quite a while. So I appreciate that they get you back to your turn pretty quickly. Or an Eldritch, where you've got to move every monster. Some monsters move in their own specific way, like the Hound of Tindalos, or you have Reckoning effects, and then you think, whose turn is it? Where are we? It does make it nice and simple. At least, of course, we can only speak for this initial scenario. For me, in terms of things that I really resonated with uh, in this first playthrough, the board, which is the scenario book itself, it has been so long since we played a tabletop role-playing game in person. We had been playing pretty regularly with a group before the pandemic uh, and virtually with another group before the pandemic, but then of course being able to connect in person became far less frequent. Um, and while I love the artwork that you create online for our various tabletop role-playing games, my darling Dungeon Master, it was nice to see a really pretty pre-made board. Uh, I would say I take offense to that, but you are completely correct. So uh, no offense taken. My, I'm a terrible artist. All playful and loving teasing aside, I'm having a lot of fun getting to be on a campaign team with you. I mean, I love that you are our, our GM and have created a huge world for us that we are still working through in our... Um, Pathfinder game, but I'm having a lot of fun getting to interact in a world with you as another player character. Yeah, it's nice to be on the same team when it comes to combat. All in all, though, the first scenario is over pretty quickly. You have a small handful of pushover enemies to defeat, and then you get your rewards and you get to start looking ahead to the future of what else is left in the scenario book. And so that's what we are going to be tying up this conversation with, or our own predictions or things we're looking forward to the next time we come back to Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. For you, Rob, is there anything high on the list that you're hoping to see? I'm excited to see more of the character growth. You do get a card upgrade as part of your awards for that first scenario, and I feel like just the uh, the growth given at the end of the first level of the tutorial is a good sign that within that box that goes along with your character, there's lots of fun things that you'll get to earn and upgrade your character with as we go along. So I'm excited to see how the, all the character growth is handled because I really don't know how much control you have over it. What about you? What's on the top of your list? So now that I've played tabletop role-playing games for a few years, I'm curious to know is there going to be room to role play in this? You know, you and I were having fun in the first scenario trying to inject a little bit of character flair where we could, but at least in the first scenario, it's very combat focused and I found a more limited opportunity to get into character simply drawing cards and taking actions. I'm hoping that there's going to be some room for this as the game progresses. While we haven't seen it built into the game thus far, it's possible that um, there is some branching paths or decision making, because I know on the map of the world, the stickers that you get to place to show what missions are available to you, it does say in the rulebook that it will show you what's available at any given time. So you might have an opportunity to pick which level you're going to or which scenario you're going to based on decisions that your characters are making. It also might not be. A lot of the storytelling and role-playing might just be in the scenario book, and we'll just have to inject our own character flair while we're playing through the levels, if that's what we want to do. So it will definitely be interesting to see how that shakes out. I think Profion will be just fine with his own flair. He does fight with a sickle on the end of a chain, so he clearly wants to draw a lot of attention to himself. He wants to be very unique. 
for now, though, with uh, our predictions for next time made, we do want to share our final thoughts. Again, the goal of this series is to take a game that is that has a dangerous reputation of being complex or intimidating or too big for many people to pull the trigger on buying or buy and then let sit on the shelf of shame. We want to share that this game is accessible. If it's sitting on your shelf of shame, open it up, look at the instructions, watch the videos if you find that format helpful, and jump in. I know we spent a lot of time thinking that this game was going to be too much to take on, and while we've only done the first of five tutorial scenarios, I at least feel like that is a good starting point for taking a little bite-sized piece of a much larger game and really building some momentum for it. Do you feel similarly after this first session? Yeah, I feel energized to come back to it, and if I had felt that it was too much to handle, I'd be dreading it, which I'm not, so I am looking forward to the next time we get to play. Awesome. Well, we hope that this is helpful for someone out there who felt similarly to, who felt the same way as us about this game being too much to handle. So uh, we are, of course, going to come back to this and share some more of our thoughts as we continue to progress through the tutorial and jump into the main game. And with that, thank you for listening to our first Gloom Cravens episode of Hours Played. We don't know when we'll publish the next installment in this series, um, but we are looking forward to being able to play more, so be on the lookout for when we drop the next Gloom Cravens episode. However, next time, we're going to be back in our main format, highlighting co-op games for couples for our next episode. Rob, you know what would be like a lot of fun and not at all like real life? Mm, no, I can't think of anything. Playing a co-op game that lets you pretend to move items in boxes out of your home. Oh boy. That's right, listeners. We have reached the finish line of our home search. And to celebrate, we're going to be playing Moving Out, developed by DevM Games and SMG Studios. Great. So when we're done packing our actual house, we can go and pack or unpack our virtual house? I think this one might like let you be a robot, though. Okay, sold. So if you want to listen to us complain about packing and then talk about virtual packing, make sure to catch our next episode. If you're enjoying listening to us, be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at, at @hoursplayed. Thanks for listening, and we will talk to you soon. See you later.